Hello, and welcome to Good News Rhode Island, the show about Rhode Island and the people and places and events who make Rhode Island a great place to live, that build our communities. I want to remind everyone that uh, even during the summer, the food bank needs your help. And so if you have food to give to your local food pantry, that would be great. But just remember, it's not just Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter and other holidays that we need to have your food. So please remember the food bank. Today, we have a special guest who everyone loves to hear and loves to meet. Len Cabral is here, the storyteller par excellence of Rhode Island. And he's here with us to talk about summer and to talk about his family. And so we welcome you again, Len. Thanks yeah. for being here. It's so nice to see you. It's always a pleasure to come here, Julia. So you're here because you go around the country telling stories. But all stories somehow start with family. Oh, yes. And all stories start when you're a little kid and you're walking along the street and you're thinking things up in your head and you're mm. using your imagination in the way only kids know how to do. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your childhood so the kids that are watching might know what to do with their imaginations. Well, you know, I spend a lot of uh, time growing up outside, as many people in my generation did. We were outside a lot. We were... Um, we, we played sports, we went on hikes, we just built tree forts, we sat in the yard, we uh, sang, we, we played together, we listened to adults. We didn't have the dis distractions that the children of today are growing up with, with the uh, computers and the cell phones and all these things. So we, we talked more and I think we, uh, we listened more also. And it was just uh, an adventure. Every day was an adventure growing up. I grew up in North Providence when uh, it, was, it was nothing like it is now. There's a lot of farms there and old families there. Families, you know, two generations of the same family. Uh, people came over from the old country, whichever old country that was. Um, there, it was all, always the old country. I thought the old country was a place on a planet <laughs> because if this person always said, oh, I'm from the old country. Oh, I'm from the old country. In the old country, we did it this way. In the old country, we did it that way. And I thought the old country was a place where they all came from, but they came from different countries in Europe. But isn't that a good Africa. image to say we've all come from the same place? Yeah, it you know? was, it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So as you were walking <laughs> along, you were telling stories. As you were listening to your family, did you have any storytellers in your family? Oh, yeah. I had uh, some uncles. Um, uh, my mom is a good storyteller. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather, everybody. You know, uh, people told stories, and it wasn't necessarily sit down and we'll tell you a story. They just had conversations, and those conversations were, were about the environment, were about you know the neighborhood, uh, about travels, about work, um, about uh, what our uncles did when they were young, about uh, you know as as we were helping our uncles um, who were mechanics. Uh, underneath the hood and handing them a wrench and learning about tools. There were stories to be told. There were uh, cautionary tales about don't go down there because there's a, the swamp is down there or the boogeyman is down there or be <laughs> home before the street lights are on, and, uh, you know, which was a lose-lose situation because you didn't know they were on until they were on. Uh, so there was these, these type of things growing up. And, and there were a lot of elderly people living in the community. We didn't have so many uh, uh, nursing homes, uh, so our grandparents lived with us. Uh, my, my friend's grandparents lived with them, they're next door. And so uh, there were always elderly people around, so the neighborhood was safe because they'd be sitting around looking out the window, keeping an eye on the community. And they'd also be part of the community. They were farming, they were shopping, and so we were uh, together with all ages. And so it was a real community that we don't often have now, except in older communities where people do grow up in the same place yes. for a long time. Right. And, you know, growing up, I, f I feel blessed because I grew up and there was an Armenian family. There were a number of Armenian families or Bulgarian families there were French. There was the Irish, there were the Cape Verdeans. And so uh, we shared foods and music and... Um, and stories, and, and I bet. And stories, <laughs> and lots of stories, yeah. 
Now, I just learned, and I don't know why I didn't know, that, one, that your grandfather was a whaler. Yes. And um, that you have some stories about whaling, or at least about his experience as a whaler. And I wonder if you would start out by telling us something about that. Well, my, uh, actually, on, on my father's side, uh, his, uh, my great-grandfather on his side, was a, his name was Ben Varela. And he came to uh, America as a whaler with uh, uh, Portuguese whaling ships. And that's how a lot of Cape Verdeans left Cape Verde to seek their fortune by taking a job on a ship. And so they sailed uh, around the world. And many of those ships came to New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is a whaling capital, though some people think Nantucket is a whaling capital. But anyway, he came there and he realized he wasn't going to make a living being a whaler. So he went down to uh, Wayham in Rochester, and there was a farm there, and he got a job on a farm. And he was a good worker, and he saved money, and he ended up buying that farm. And he went back to Cape Verde to get his family, his wife, and his two daughters. And, on the and when he got there, his oldest daughter, Matilda, had eloped. And so when he said to his wife, where's Matilda? She said, well, she eloped, and she's living up in the mountains. And he said, well, you go tell her that her husband is now my son, and we're all going to America to come on. And so they took on a ship. Uh, uh, they, they, they left uh, Cape Verde Islands on a ship. Uh, the, the ship was named the Notice. And when it left, it ran into a storm, and the main sail was broken. It lost its sail, and it was adrift out at sea. And the captain, they say, either jumped overboard or was swept overboard. Now, Ben Varela, because he'd been a whaler for most of his life, he and the first mate took over the ship, and they rationed the food, and they started a bucket brigade to keep the boat uh, uh, afloat. And it just was drifting out there, and people thought they were going to die. People were praying and crying, and the storm was coming. And the, the story goes, he tied a rope around himself, his wife, his two daughters, and his son-in-law, and he tied them to the to the, uh, on deck. The broken mast, The broken maybe. mast, tied them to the broken mast so they wouldn't get swept overboard. And everybody just thought, this was it, they were gonna perish. When all of a sudden, an Italian steamer came by, and it was like a miracle, and saw them and threw ropes to them and towed them in to Ellis Island. This was in 1902. Towed them into Ellis Island, and from there, they got to New Bedford, uh, back to the New Bedford, Massachusetts. But the kicker of the story, in 1902, there's a, uh, in New York Times, is the story about an Italian ship towing in a ship uh, from Cape Verde Islands into Ellis Island. That was a ship that my great-grandfather, Ben Varela, was on. So I, told, I shared this story a few weeks ago in New Bedford, Massachusetts, at the Whaling Museum. Of I, I tell this story, <laughs> and an elderly gentleman in his 80s, who was in the audience, he raised his hand and he said, that story is my story, because that's, this is the first time I heard this story outside of my family. My grandmother was on that ship, and she told the story about the fella Ben Varela and how he saved this ship and how it was towed into Ellis Island. And that's the first time this fella had heard that story outside of his family. And so he, it, he justified the story, and we have the articles of the New York Times and uh, so it was just a wonderful experience to have somebody say, my grandmother was on that ship, and it was the first time he heard it outside of his family, and he heard it in public. So there are waves of storytelling, oh, aren't waves, there? Yes. And they're One in story different leads families. to another story and connects us. And that certainly was a connection with, without, with his grand and my great-grand. So stories used to be the way we learned most Everything. of what we knew about our own environment, was, yes. weren't they? That's right. And as we have become more and more technical, we have lost stories in a way. Yeah, we have. And certainly have lost storytelling and the grandfather telling the son and the son telling That's his right. son. And we, what we've dropped is listening skills. And with, through listening, we gain respect for one another because if we hear the stories, we, hear, we respect each other's by listening. <laughs> That's in respect in itself, listening to someone. Uh, but then what we learn about another person's journey in life through their stories. And I think um, 
you know, t in today's society with so, so many distractions, we uh, do not listen well enough. There's an African proverb that says, we have two ears and one mouth, which means we should listen twice, twice. as much as we should speak. <laughs> So you go around to schools and you tell stories and yes. you go to festivals and you tell stories and yes. you sit and talk probably over a cup of coffee and you tell stories. <laughs> a it's a way of life for you and it's a meaning maker, isn't it? it yes. It somehow puts everything into context. It is. I feel blessed. I've been telling stories professionally for 38 years. I travel internationally. Last September, I was fortunate enough to be invited to a festival in Singapore. I was worked in Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, I've been to Ireland to tell stories in Ireland, which was a real treat, in Belgium and many other places in Europe. Uh, and, a, and around the country, there are festivals happening all around the country that uh, once in a while I go and tell stories at those festivals. I enjoy mostly telling stories in schools because, because I'm working kids with are, youth. Kids are so ready, aren't they? They're so ready and it's so important. I mean, you can look at children who have been raised on TV their whole life. I mean, you know, they've watched TV every day of their life, the movies, the video games, but you, you sit them in a room, and I don't care if they're high school students or elementary school students, they get hooked into a story, and they focus, and they listen, and they can tell you the story over, and it's done. So what do you think that you're giving them? I mean, I feel like you're starting to make a different world available to them, that you're starting to let them know what it's like to even tell a story themselves, or to start to listen to other people differently. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope I'm giving them a, a, a resource or a, a technique to interview, to become good listeners and to also to connect with, reconnect with their parents and their grandparents mm -hmm. um, and learn history firsthand from interviewing your, your grandmother, your grandfather. Um, and some of these children have great grandparents to get them those stories. I tell them, you know, you put that put that computer away, put that Game Boy down because, you know, you can always play the Game Boy, but you won't always be able to talk with your grandmother. Mm -hmm. So take this opportunity to, to have the conversation with your grandmother. And I give them little tips on how to st how to get icebreakers and how to uh, um, start a conversation with their grandmother. How to, what questions to ask like. What was your first job? You know, uh, uh, did you ever get bit by a dog? Um, stuff like, how'd you meet your grandpa? Uh, these type of things, which lead to other stories. What I tell people in my profession is that stories are holy and that they are sort of the foundation mm -hmm. of family. Mm -hmm. And that when stories are shared, one person to another, those stories become even more holy because they have a next generation. That's it. And I think that's what you're saying yeah. as well. There's a wonderful storyteller who passed away, who was a well-known storyteller, lived up in uh, Massachusetts, Brother Blue. Now, Brother Blue would say, when you're telling stories, you're on holy ground. Mm. And you just brought, by you saying what you said, brought Brother Blue back to me and, the, and things that he would say, because it was... It's, it's, a, it's on holy ground. We're sharing stories because we're telling, we're communicating. Mm -hmm. And uh, stories are such a powerful uh, learning technique, uh, tool. Uh, it's, uh, it's a way to engage our listeners. It's a way to educate. It's a way to entertain. And it's, uh, it's all right there with stories. And stories all around us. The movies that we see began as stories. Uh, many of these movies that we see are from folklore. Mm -hmm. You know, they're ancient. They're, the uh, the stories all around us, and sometimes some of the some of the answers to our social problems are in stories. If we read those stories and listen to people's stories, we get to understand them a little better. Our our life seems very um, present, but mm -hmm. in actuality, it's been lived before. Yes. I mean, other people have had the yeah. same problems. Mm -hmm. Len, yeah. I don't want to take another minute without having you tell your story about summer because we're about to move into summer and you have a summer story. So yeah. would you please tell us your story? I certainly would. <laughs> Thank you. This is a story penned by a woman named Ann Rockwell out of Connecticut, an elderly woman, and I wish her well. And the version of the story I do is called Buzz, buzz, once there was 
a little boy, and his name was John. And John couldn't do anything right. Whenever John played baseball, he always made the first out. Whenever John played tag, he was always it. Whenever John played hide and seek, he was always the first one found. John couldn't do anything right. Well, it was summertime, you know. School had just closed. It was the beginning of summer vacation. And John was sitting on his steps, and his friends were on the lawn, and they were sitting on his steps. And you know what the boys and girls say. As soon as school closes, as soon as summer vacation starts, they say, there's nothing to do. It's boring. There's nothing to do. And John was bored. He didn't want to play tag. <laughs> He'd always be it. Or hide and seek. He'd be found. John thought he'd run away from home. So John, he ran a, about a block away from his house, and he thought he'd rest for a little while. He wasn't in the greatest of shape. And John, he sat down on the ground, and he, that's, he leaned up against a tree, and the summer sun was shining on his face, and it lulled John to sleep. And as John was sleeping, a little snail with a silver shell crawled through the grass over to John's shoulder, and that snail with the silver shell crawled up John's shoulder and up John's neck. And that snail with the silver shell crawled up to John's ear and said, John, I know you, John. You're a good boy. You just can't do anything right. John, I'm going to tell you 100 stories no one else has ever heard. John, you can share those stories with your friends. And that snail told John, 100 stories that no one else had ever heard. And then all of a sudden, a bumblebee flew by John's ear. Buzz, buzz, once there was. And John opened his eyes just in time to hear his mother's voice come floating by. John, John. It was supper time. John forgot all about running away from home. John went back home. He had a nice big supper. And after supper, he sat on the steps. And his friends came over. And they sat on the lawn. And you know what they say in the summertime. There's nothing to do. It's boring. There's nothing to do. And John said, I could tell you a story. What, John? I said, I could tell you a story. Hey, John's going to tell us a story. John's going to tell us a story. Go ahead, John. We're listening. And John told them a story, and they said, wow, John, that was, that was OK. Do you know another one? And John told him another, say, John, that was awesome. And so was the first one. Do you know another one, John? And John told him another. Go, Johnny, go. And John told story after story after story. And then it started getting late. And the sun came out. The sun went down. And the moon came out. And the stars came out. And their parents came out looking for them. And they sat down listening to stories, too, until the mosquitoes came out. And they all went home. But the next morning, all John's friends came back, and they sat on the steps, and John told stories all that day, and all the next day, and all the following day. And John told story after story after story. And then one day, John started to tell a story, and the little girl said, excuse me, John, but you already told us that story. Don't you know any other stories? And John said, no, I, I don't know any other stories. I, I told you all the stories that I know. You don't know any other stories? <laughs> John is boring, John is boring. John felt terrible. He thought he'd go look for that snail with the silver shell. So John ran back to that field. He was looking everywhere. He looked in the bushes, on the logs, up in the trees. He, he couldn't find that snail anywhere. Then John thought he'd wrestle a while and look for that snail later. So he leaned against a tree and he was a little tired. He put his hand down on the ground and it landed on a rock. And John thought, Maybe the snail with the silver shell lives under this rock. And John picked up that rock, and right there stood a witch about the size of a gummy bear. She looked up at John and said, what do you want, John? Can't you see I'm teaching magic tricks to the worms, how to dig holes in the ground and come back up? I'm sorry, but do you know where the snail lives with the silver shell? John, you'll never find that snail. That snail lives way over there. Thank you. Close the door, OK? And John went across the field. And he, went, he walked into a field full of mushrooms. They were taller than John. And, he, and then he saw a little old man sitting on a tree stump. He had a long gray beard and Oshkosh jeans. He said, excuse me, sir, but do you know where the snail with the silver shell lives? 
snail with a silver shell? I know that snail, John. He told me a hundred stories, but I didn't have anybody to share those stories with. You'll never find that snail. You might as well give up. He lives way over there. Thank you. And John ran through that field full of mushrooms until he came into a forest. He looked up in a tree and he saw a bear climbing a tree and he said, excuse me, Mr. Bear, do you know where the snail with the silver shell lives? And the bear looked down at John and said, John, how can you ask me a question like that now? Can't you tell I'm climbing this tree? I'm trying to get the moon out the sky. It messes with my sleep every night. I'm going to pull it right out of the sky. Yeah, but do you know where the snail with the silver shell lives? You never find that snail, John. He lives way over there. Thank you. And John ran through that field, through the forest, until he came to the beach. And the waves were coming in, splashing back and forth. He looked out in the water, and there was a dozen mermaids on the back of a whale. And they all had long hair. Some had black hair, and some had brown hair. And they were braiding each other's hair like this. And John said, excuse me, mermaids, do you know where the snail with the silver shell lives? And the mermaid said, John, before you find a snail with a silver shell, you have to do something very good. What is it? I'll do anything. We can't tell you. And they dove into the water. And the whale dove up in the air and came down with his mighty tail. Splash! And got John soaking wet. And John walked across that sandy beach until he came into a field. It was a green field. Oh, it went on and on like the fields you see in Ireland. And he saw a little white spot. Well, he ran over to that spot and he looked. It wasn't a spot at all. He thought it was a golf ball. It wasn't a golf ball at all. It was a furry little bunny. Hi, bunny. And the bunny said, oh, John, you startled me, Johnny. I'm lost. I'm really lost, John. I'll never find my way home. I'm lost. I've done it to myself this time. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe I can help you. Where do you live? You can't help me, John. You don't know where I live in a field full of mushrooms, John. It's on the other side of a beach and through the forest. <laughs> Come on. I know where you live. And John scooped up that bunny and walked back across the field, back along the beach, looked out, and the mermaids are back on the whale, braiding each other's hair, sort of winking at John. And John walked through that forest with all the trees, and he looked up, and the bear was still climbing that tree, trying to get the moon out the sky. And then he walked into that field full of mushrooms, and he saw that little old man with a long beard, Oshkosh jeans, and right below that tree stump, there was a little mother bunny. And John said, hey, Miss Bunny, is this your baby? Yes, it is, Johnny, indeed it is. And ran over and squeezed a little baby. Ooh, 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 ooh. And John said, Mother Bunny, do you know where the snail with the silver shell lives? Oh, yes, John. He lives right down that path. Go down there, go to your left, take three steps to your right, step over a log, and then keep going. And you see a, a wall, John. When you face that wall, say, buzz, buzz, once there was. John, the wall will open up. The snail lives down there. But, John, be very careful, because down there lives a fire-breathing dragon. Would you like a salad? But John was already gone. And John, he went three steps to his left, three steps to his right, stepped over, locked, turned around, faced the wall and said, buzz, buzz, once there was. And the wall went. And John walked down that corridor, trying to be real quiet as possible. When all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came a fire-breathing dragon. Ah! Johnny, I'm going to eat you up, John. Uh, oh, please don't eat me up. I'm looking for the snail with the silver shell. He told me 100 stories. My friends think I'm boring. I need some more stories. I know that snail, John. He told me stories, too, but he won't tell me anymore. I'm going to eat him up, him up too. Uh, but, uh, would you eat me up if I told you 50 stories? Yes. Uh, would you eat me up if I told you 75 stories? Yes. Uh, would you eat me up if I told you 100 stories? Mm, maybe. Maybe not. And John told that fire-breathing dragon 100 stories. And that dragon did John up, dragon said, hey, John, I was only kidding about that eating up stuff. The snail's right around the corner. Go ahead. And John went around, and there was a snail. And John said, oh, snail, I'm so glad I found you. My friends think I'm boring. I need some more stories. Can you tell me some more stories? And the snail said, John, I don't know any more stories. I told you all the stories that I know. You have to make up your own, John. My own? My own, my own. Just then a bumblebee flew by John's ear and said, buzz, buzz, once there was. And John opened his eyes and there he was in that field with his hand on that rock. John hadn't been anywhere. John was dreaming. 
And just then he heard his mother's voice come floating by. John! John! It was supper time. John went back home. He had a nice big supper. And then he sat on the steps and his friends came over. And you know what they say in the summertime. There's nothing to do. It's boring. There's nothing to do. And he said, hey, John, do you know any stories? And John said, no, I, I don't know any stories. Like, John, it's boring. Yeah, just then, a bumblebee flew across the yard over to John's ear and said, buzz, buzz, once there was a little boy. His name is John. And John said, hey, well, I do know a story. Okay, John knows a story. Go ahead. Go tell us, Johnny. Go. John said, once there was a witch about the size of a gummy bear. She taught magic tricks to all the worms, how to dig holes in the ground, clump a little petals. And then she told a story about a bear climbing a tree, trying to get the moon out the sky because it messed with the sleep at night. And then he told a story about a dozen mermaids on the back of a whale braiding each other's hair. It's a little old man with a long gray beard and had Oshkosh jeans. And John told story after story after story. And whenever John ever almost ran out of stories, it never failed. A bumblebee would float through the air over to John's ear and say, Buzz, buzz, once there was... It's You're interesting nice. how many stories have a pursuit, a long journey, mm. a period of being lost, a period of being scared, terrified, thinking yeah. nothing was going to work well, a period of resolution, and then a sense of wholeness at yeah. the end. Yeah. And boy, do we need to hear those stories. Don't we? Though, don't we? And you know, yeah. I don't think it matters what age person hears your stories. They want to hear them again. There's something about the fact that all of that... Um, armor that we get in life falls away mm. and we can listen in a different way. Yeah. So thank you, Len Cabral, for you're your welcome stories. Very much. Thank you for what you're doing. And just say one second, he has CDs, which you can find on Amazon, a book called Storytelling, Len Cabral Storytelling. And you are going to be in Newport. And I'm going to be at the uh, South, in South Kingston on July 10th. Um, I believe it's July 10th. I think I may have something. That's all right. They can look okay. it up. Uh, at the uh, Green Festival. The Green Festival. And I'm going to be at Fisher Island uh, in July. Uh, it's August 10th. The Green Festival, August 10th. And July 10th, uh, I will be uh, in, uh, on Fisher Island, library in Fisher Island. And then we have the Rhythm and Roots Festival in Labor Day weekend. I always perform there. That's down in Ninigrit Park. Okay, so what you need to do is to look online yes. and try to find Len. And thanks for watching Good News Red Island. I'm sure there's good news in your community. Probably you're helping to make it, and it's right around the corner. Please tell stories. Oh, good.